And if you, you wouldn't be here if I was a sound expert. So anyway, let's go. Uh, this uh, video today is about a whole bunch of stuff, including macro monetary debasement, Bitcoin, new Solana price targets, which blew my mind, and they're not even my real price targets. They're sandbagged. Um, helium mining, a new chain link, which actually is really interesting. And thank you all for promoting tokens that are actually have pretty good fundamentals uh, and a whole bunch more. We'll also talk about Coinbase is worth a flurry, Lithium and Tesla, etc., and other challenges. So let's jump in. Thank you all for being here and thank you to the mods in the chat. I assume my, and this is edutainment, I assume my sound is working too. And a shout out to everybody as well on Patreon. And this is from USS Liberty. Dude, I had his Patreon for a week and it paid for itself. Thank you so much, USS Liberty. We were sold out, but we opened a couple more seats because people were saying, it's unfair, you're sold out, but that's what happens in the bull market. We like to keep it small and intimate. But anyway, here we go. First question from the wonderful Patreon community is one fit pork chop. I've spent the entire bear market running into burning buildings to accumulate and was able to fill a nice bag of Solana. My goal is to leave the corporate world and teach seniors how to be safely active and fit. Can you update the retire on Sol in the US table to reflect retiring end of year 2025? So one fit pork chop. You should do some personal training for me too. That'd be great. I'm a senior as well. But first of all, honor and kudos to you. Appreciation, of course, for your commitment to assisting others, living a life-driven, a purpose-driven life, as I call it, is truly commendable. And there's nothing more valuable Okay, imagine this channel is about, you know, retiring, getting out of the rat race and doing good. And you're one of them doing that. So, so proud of you. Let's talk about a couple of things, because to do that whole retire on, there's a lot of work behind the scenes and it takes more than a weekend to do, but I will do it. Okay, uh, but 2025 is a tricky year. And, and let me explain why 2025 is a tricky year, because I do anticipate the end of the bull run will happen circa maybe September, October timeframe 2025. But considering things are happening sooner and faster, it could end earlier. But then again, the impact of the Bitcoin halving is reduced every cycle. And in addition, we could have a perpetual supply of money coming into the space from spot ETFs and BlackRock and Aladdin, etc. So we're not sure, but we'll be able to tell when we get close to the time. So let's talk about a couple of things that have changed with the Solana price targets. One, it's moved very, very fast. It's moved very, very high. And it's moved very, very early. And it's become the consensus trade. Woohoo! I thought it would have been the consensus trade in 2021. But oftentimes in my life, I am early. But I like to be getting in early, getting in hard. And that's just me. Timing is really difficult. And I try to be good at it. But hey, better early than missing the boat altogether. So let's look at some hypothetical price targets. And I can't tell you the number of people that have asked me about this over the last couple of weeks and the most number of people who are very upset that they missed the boat, and the, but far outnumbered by the number of people who are delighted that they're on the boat and were able to jump into that burning building, as you say. So I do have price targets that are based on fees. I have price targets based on Metcalf's law. I have price targets based on the total crypto market cap, etc. But this is just a series of quick back of the napkin spreadsheet price targets based on last year's bull run. Okay, really, really simple terms. So first of all, I pulled out the ETH market cap today, and that's 246 billion. And I have the market cap of ETH at all time high, 572 billion. So we are basically 131% from all time high. So if you want something to go back to an all time high, and then you want it to be ETH, you make 131%. And remember, you made that in Solana in the last month. So that's how crazy it is. I always knew Solana would outperform, but never this much so fast. So again, we'll see. Then we have the Solana market cap today, 25 billion. Uh, market cap at all time high was 77 billion. Then we have the Cardano market cap today, 13.7 billion. And the market cap at all time high, 95 billion dollars. So Mar Cardano had a market cap nearly $100 billion. Now it's only 13. So you think looking at this, ooh, so, you know, Cardano could do a 6x from here. Whereas for Solana to get just back to its old, old market cap high, be 200%. So should I go in and buy Cardano? Well, you know the answer to that. Drop a comment below if you don't know, and I'll answer it later for you. 
Anyway, um, so I had these price targets. We've got the Sol upside model that's been around for years now. And our, I always believed Cardano would exceed, or Solana would exceed Cardano market cap. It smashed that. Then 6% of ETH, 14.8 billion. It smashed that. Then the next target was 20, 10%, 24.6 billion. And believe it or not, we are pretty much beating that as well. The next one in the box is what I call the 20% of ETH market cap, which takes us to 50 billion dollars that would be a solid price of 117 dollars but there's more now what i'm going to do is focus on the bottom half which is the hypothetical what happens if these percentages relate to previous all-time highs from the last bull run which again remember crypto market cap went to three trillion many people believe this time around it could go to 10 trillion or at least five if it does wow but i'm only assuming we hit three trillion from last time around and I'm not even assuming we're assuming that Solana is a consensus trade. So here, uh, if we exceed the market cap or just match the market cap of Cardano at all-time highs, that would mean a sol price of $224. Uh, the 6% of ETH at all-time high, that would be $81. bucks. 10 percent of ETH at all-time high, $135. 20% of ETH at all-time high, $271. Bucks. And a new one, 30%. Again, this is kind of part of the whole consensus trade piece. That could take us to $406. So I know it's a lot to digest. So I create a little visual for you all to see. And you can anchor on whatever you believe. So back to the question, what could the retire on look like for 2025? It'll be somewhere in this range and it could even be higher. Literally, these are heavily sandbagged. So let's look at the average 151. If you were buying Solana at $8 at the bottom, that I was stacking, and you all saw my Patreon post on that, and you stake as well, <laughs> the results, the returns are absolutely mind-blowing. I will actually do a video on that too. But here, if you take the average of all of these, 151 bucks, if you take really the top one, 30% of ETH market cap, of all-time high of the last bull run, $406. Considering how far we've moved and how fast we moved, that is not beyond the realm of craziness. And by the way, I'm not even talking about the Van Eck $3,200 for 20, 2030 target as well. So again, take these as you please. The ones I kind of think about anchoring on would be, you know, maybe somewhere between 135 and 225 to be very, very conservative at this rate, but could very easily be a lot higher. And this is an exciting time. Now just imagine for a second, and there's rumors flying around the BlackRock They've launched the infrastructure for the Ethereum spot ETF, and they know the next one in the box is going to be Solana. If BlackRock launches Solana ETF, game over. Game over. And then they start doing real-world asset tokenization on the chain, on top of the 11th biggest company in the world, Visa, uh, using it for payments. That's it. That's the black hole. The black hole. Anyway, let's move on. Thank you for the question. Eagle HQ. Sorry, Eagle for HG, excuse my eyes. In my retirement account, I'm heavily invested in GBTC currently, trying to avail of the discount, which hopefully will go to zero when the iTrust, etc. Bitcoin EGF goes live. When that happens, will it be more beneficial to sell my GBTC and convert to the likes of an iTrust spot ETF to avail of lower management fees? So great question. Uh, first of all, if Grayscale moves to a spot ETF, they're going to have to reduce their fees to like one quarter of 1% down from 2% it is right now to compete. But remember, Grayscale is also the biggest. There's 630,000 Bitcoin in that bag. And uh, BlackRock have a long way to catch up. But I think BlackRock will have the most security, the most accessibility by things like funds, retirement funds, etc. And they probably will have the lowest fee as well to get the lion's share of the goodies. So I say, wait for the discount to close to zero, then examine IBTC fees, which is the ticker for the BlackRock spot Bitcoin ETF versus GBTC, whatever that's called after the fact, after it moves to the spot ETF. And yes, move to the lowest fees. Fees have a dramatic impact, dramatic impact on your returns, especially over a longer period of time. You're talking 10 years plus and people are taking two and a half percent of your returns. That is absolutely hammering you so always go for the minimum fees too thank you for the question next one is from rolf the mops um as far as i understand the difference between spot etf and a trust etf is that with the trust the underlying asset must be bought 
So how can the spot ETF create buying pressure? That's a very, very good question. So the simple answer to that is the spot, well, the spot ETF, let me describe them first and then the, the buying pressure will be kind of pretty clear from there. So the Bitcoin spot ETFs track the price of Bitcoin, which is the price at which Bitcoin is currently being traded on exchanges. And spot ETFs are backed by the physical Bitcoin. So that means that the ETF issuer must actually own the Bitcoin that has been tracked by the ETF. So every time they sell an ETF share, they need to stack Bitcoin almost in real time or have some type of a mechanism by which to fund the actual spot ETF. Now, a Bitcoin trust ETF like Grayscale does not track the spot price of Bitcoin. Instead, they track the net asset value of the Bitcoin that they hold. And the net asset value of the Bitcoin is the value of the Bitcoin at the time when it was purchased by the ETF issuer, minus any fees, expenses, etc. that have occurred by the ETF, and can be subject to extreme premiums and discounts. So I hope for our previous question, that was from Eagle4HQ. I hope you got it at the 55% discount because that was a killer. Um, or the 50% discount for GBTC. And now it's a 10%, which I shared on Patreon yesterday with the model. But that would be uh, great for you. It is going to zero because the spot ETF is coming. And that's the difference. And uh, don't look at some of the other grayscale ETFs. Some of them are still trading at extreme premiums. You don't want to buy something that's trading at a premium, ladies and gentlemen. So next question is from LLLRCG. Can you please do a should I buy deep dive on Teller? Uh, actually, it does pique my interest. So to do a deep dive, it takes tens of hours to pull all the data together. But I will give you some cursory information that we have from our crypto compendium. First of all, it is great on the crypto compendium. It has a really, really good score compared to others. And this is not the ranking of all the oracles. This on data management place, this is alphabetically ranked. Okay. The other thing that's great about Teller is it is very actively traded. And I like to see that the more demand there is, the more volume there is, the better the sign that the token actually has something going for it. It's only second behind mask and Teller network runs at about 45.6% of market cap in trading volume, which is massive. In addition, Teller is near full supply. It is at the very top. It's at 98% of max supply, which means you're not going to get crucified by inflation. Very, very good note too. But there is one little thing that is also awesome to see, and that is only trading at 1 40th of the market cap of Chainlink. And you can see here the rankings of market cap dominance and compare them all yourself. And you can see that it is trading at a very, very low valuation, which could technically mean a lot of upside if we were to catch or even chase Chainlink as well. And that's what you look for. If you look for something that is, you know, as good as we're trading at a huge discount, you go for it. But there is one thing that I don't like very much, but this may be a misleading number. This is Teller with the number of daily active users at 158. You can see here, looks rare is only 300. OMG network, 280. Badger Dow, 306, etc. So you gotta look at these very, very carefully. Audius, <laughs> I slated that, I think in a should I buy last year, a couple of years ago. 153 daily active users, they're not gonna make it. So uh, daily active users is a tad weak, but if the users are huge, imagine like JP Morgan is using Teller for real world asset tokenization. That's a different kettle of fish rather than some guy in his basement or whatever. So uh, we will have a look and see if it's worthy. Um, I try, if I do or should I buy, I try, I try not to not buy it because people are upset if I do or should I buy and I don't buy it, then they get very upset and very toxic. Anyway, we'll see. I'll have a look. Thank you for the question. Next question is from Rocky Raccoon. In the spirit of supporting blockchain, I'm looking to do something other than just buying crypto assets. Since I live in South Florida, I'm evaluating setting up a couple of Helium nodes. What are your thoughts on Helium in general from Rocky Raccoon? Well, it's good. What they're trying to do is very rev revolutionary. Basically sell, you know, cell phone access, 5G access for $5 a month, which would completely disrupt 
the traditional cell phone players. They operate in a few different regions right now. But in full disclosure, I'm not a miner. I am not a helium miner. I do different stuff. But uh, let's go through some numbers, if it's worth it or not, first of all. Yes, it can be profitable, but it depends on a number of factors. For example, location, 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 just like real estate. Uh, also, the competition, how many hotspots are in your area. And of course, the price of the token. You know, there are times when the price of the token goes crazy and then everybody's profitable mining helium. But when it's depressed, like during a bear market, it's not so good. In addition, uh, some example returns, just to make sure you don't waste your time if these returns aren't adequate. But um, the price, as I mentioned, of helium drives the actual result of the mining. And if the price is low, miners may not earn enough to cover the costs. But if it's average or high, they will. And as of, I think it was summer 2023, and uh, the average helium hotspot was earning about $5 per month. But if you add up the cost of your hotspot, you know, you might be close to break even. However, there are some miners in high density areas that are earning a lot more. For example, one miner in San Francisco reportedly earns over a thousand bucks a month. So again, it depends where you are, be where the demand is and have your antennas there. If you're in a rural farm somewhere it's not going to work but if you are in a place surrounded by high rises and condos and hotels and restaurants and stuff you could do very well so i hope that helps also a couple of little pro tips too because uh, we do have helium miners in the community make sure you have it in that high density area make sure your high quality miner has a strong antenna a lot of people actually run a long cable to have a very antenna the high antenna that's very high up and also keep the firmware up to date and monitor your miner's activity to make adjustments as needed. Maybe move it around or reposition it. Or if you discover, oh, my neighbor has just popped up 10 hotspots, that's not going to help you. So be where the others aren't, but where the traffic is. Real simple. Thanks for the question. Next question is from AMGT. And I first read that, I thought it was AGMT, like agreement. Um, NFA, but the Coinbase seems it will benefit from the next bull run and ETFs with current price around $80 and an all-time high of 300 plus, is it a good opportunity? It is a very good question because there's a lot of cool factors about Coinbase. They are doing way more than just running as an exchange. They are also doing things like custody for players like BlackRock for the spot ETF. They're doing custody for high net worth individuals and they are investing in startups and a whole bunch more. But uh, there's a couple of things I don't like. And what I do when I, when I say I don't like an investment, it means it's not in my stable. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but there are things that are red flags to me that I just don't tolerate, just like in crypto. So let's look at the past. And here you can see revenue in blue. It's kind of flat. And you wouldn't expect that considering they lost their major competitor of Binance in the US. The US is where a lot of the money comes from. Net income, flat two to negative. Um, EBITDA positive last time around, last quarter earnings, which is not bad. But this is some of what I do not like at all. And I call it pocket lining. That's when the executives pump their own bags with stocks. So they dilute you, which brings about price suppression and means number doesn't go up for the stock asset you own. But look at this. This is for 2020, 2022 full year. They had minus 1.6 billion in operating cash flow. And you know what? They decided to add exactly that amount again in stock-based compensation, taking their net income to nearly minus $3 billion. And that is ridiculous. I don't mind executives taking a piece if they generate profits. But when the thing is losing $1.5 billion, no, that's pocket line. They've been doing this all the time, you know, for a long time. So I, it just doesn't sit well with me as well. As we go forward, stock dilution, pocket lining. Let's look at some financials for Coinbase. There is no path to profit. And that's another thing is a red flag for me. I like companies that are profitable. And if there's no path to profit to 2026, I definitely don't like that. Now they could surprise the upside, but again, with their pocket lining, etc., who knows if they get there. Also, revenue growth is slow and flat. I don't like that. I like high growth. I like profitability, especially, especially in recessionary times. Critical, critical, critical to look at. In addition, let's look at the chart real quick. This is based on the layers. And you can see here from the layers, yes, it's done well. Yes, it's above the 200-day moving average. 
Yes, it's facing that resistance between kind of the $83 and $91 level, which is level five and level six. Could it pop to level seven, 112? Absolutely. Could it go higher? Yes, it could. But the question is, do you want to be in a faster horse? And uh, <laughs> there's so many more of them right now. I would not touch Coinbase. Uh, it just doesn't sit well with me. Never has. Um, I even did pre-IPO videos and I was like, don't touch this. No good. Anyway, let's talk about the next question uh, from Michael Smith. Oh, by the way, quick pro tip. Uh, do not uh, disclose. I shouldn't say that earlier. Uh, your, your full names. And of course, Michael Smith is, considering the name, I know it's a fake name because it's like John Smith, Michael Smith, whatever. It's a very common name, so it's clever. But be careful using your real name in social, on YouTube comments, etc. Especially if you have a large position in anything. Now, this question is, there's a new 2x long Tesla ETF that launched. TSLT is the ticker. What are the pros and cons of investing in this versus a traditional margin loan with 60% ratio? I'm well below that. Noting no margin call with the ETF and you get double your exposure without the interest payments. It seems a good way to go or am I missing something, keeping for a minimum of five years. So, Mr. Smith, this takes us back to fees, like uh, how important they are to look at and how they eat things alive. So you've nailed the cons pretty much in your question. So I'm just going to focus on the disadvantages of the TSLT. One, uh, <laughs> There are disadvantages. The ETFs have high fees uh, and individual stocks don't. Oftentimes these ETFs have 2.5%, 3% fees. Um, also, there is a tracking error. These ETFs may not perfectly track the performance of the underlying index. That doesn't matter too much, or the underlying asset. That doesn't matter too much if you're in the long term. But in the long term, the fees will eat you alive. Also, Leverage, the ETFs use leverage that can magnify both gains and losses, which can increase your risk. And there's limited control. You will not have the same level of control you have over your investment as you would if you were buying the individual stocks. It's like, you know, not your keys, not your coins, etc. So lots of risk. Uh, it is worth it for a quick flutter. Like if you don't have all the capital to buy all the assets you want and you see Tesla full to 106, Yes, jump on this, but get out within a month or two. Do not hold long term. That's my advice for any leverage long asset. We have tons of people in the community now making obscene money with PTOS on Sol 3x long and Sol 3x short. But again, you're in and out real quick. You're not holding long term. So you can make it work real well. Next question is from Lamarty. BMI states that global lithium supply is expected to enter a deficit relative to demand by 2025. If true, what does that mean for Tesla and other EV manufacturers? Great question. And I love the way you look forward to the future and you try and anticipate the risk and everything else is so, so important. Let's talk about the shortage issues and dig into them. There is a risk, yes, and Tesla and other EV manufacturers could face a major challenge if there is a lithium shortage as it's crucial to battery production. Now, rising lithium prices hint at a looming shortage, but prices are actually very low right now. And the industry-wide impacts, it could make EVs more expensive. It could also delay production. It could prompt a shift back to, say, gasoline, petrol, diesel, whatever you want. But people like Elon Musk, he always looks decades out. And he's been focusing on tying up his lithium supply for the longest time. He knows this is a limiting factor. Not only has he tied up the supply that he needs, but he's also gotten into the refining business because he will tell you that lithium is plentiful. There's enough of it in the world for everything you want. The problem is refining it. That's where things get stuck. Are they safe? Yes. But let me also tell you another thing as well. This is uh, whenever there is demand for something and people can see it coming in two or three years, the human ingenuity, ingenuity will find a way to refine lithium more efficiently. Tesla's already doing that, and they'll be able to make enough for themselves, I believe, pretty soon in the next three to five years. And they're doing it in Texas and other parts of the world. They also have many partnerships, pulling lithium in from Chile and other places. So uh, there is abundance of it. There is a financial incentive, which leads to innovation. 
And it is a valuable resource, but I think we'll never run out of it at all. Not concerned at all. So don't worry about that. Um, next question is from Trace H. I'm getting money soon and want to buy Bitcoin. I'm worried about the deposit issues with US banks. Also, which exchanges can I send ACH dollars for the purchase? Is there an online bank that can be trusted? Uh, Binance, KuCoin, Mexi will no longer take my US dollars. Okay, Trace. So there are places that will take your US dollars. And let me talk about those. And again, you're, you're dead right to be kind of nervous and paranoid. There are people in many countries all over the world that have bank accounts and they can't ACH or even wire out of their own accounts with their own money to a crypto exchange because their banks say, no, 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 keep your deposits with us. But think about this, you could work directly with Coinbase. They are popular, well-established, well-licensed, well-regulated in many places, and they offer a ton of features, including ACH deposits, and they are generally considered to be a safe and reliable platform. And in full disclosure, I use Coinbase as well. I don't own the stock, but I use it as a platform because there's not many options for me. Now, Gemini is another licensed crypto exchange in the US, and they are also known for their strong security measures and commitment to compliance. And Gemini also offers ACH deposits, as does Kraken, uh, regulated in several jurisdictions, including the US, and they offer a wide variety of cryptocurrencies and trading pairs, as well as ACH deposits. So you have lots of opportunities there. And I'm drinking some tea. Shout out to everyone in Seattle, my 15th biggest audience city. So thank you all for coming. Next question is from Arienzo. In your opinion, is it worth investing in exchange tokens such as Binance and CRO, etc.? And what should I think about before doing that? For example, if those two coins came back to their old all-time high, it would be amazing. But is the market still open for them after the ETF? So great question. Um, Binance is an interesting one, but let's just dig into CRO. I call these things utility tokens. You don't want to buy them for a couple of reasons. One, they all have terrible compendium scores. They all have terrible centralization. They all have terrible inflation. And they all have terrible whale ownership. So, yes, they went up a lot in the last thing. I remember the last bull run, I think it was CRO, was, had all the usual sports personalities. It was on TV. It was everywhere you could look. Um, but again, the token payer is paying for that. So why invest in these things when there's way better, safer things to go for? Look for things that don't have those four items and that'll set you straight. Um, and I know sometimes these things pump and do well. I know that Binance went from 215 to 250. Could it back, go back to 400? Pretty easily, yeah. But are there things that move much faster? Yes, there are. So I hope that helps. Next question. This one is a tricky one from Git. And uh, you have mentioned that true inflation is 14%. Is there any way to back that up with proof or is that just an educated assumption? Also, you mentioned every 10 years, the dollar gets cut in half. What percentage inflation is that factoring in? So I always talk about uh, it's more debasement, but debasement and inflation are one the same thing. It's like stock dilution. It's like token inflation. It's all the same thing. It's the expansion of the money supply. And I always say as well that if you're not making 14% return on your investments, you're not treading water, which means you're drowning. You're going backwards. But let me give you some points, not from me. And not from my educated assumptions, but from, let's say, experts. First of all, Shadow Stats has been around for 40 years. And they always speak about the inflation rates. And they track a number of real inflation indicators that are not included in the official government, U.S. government CPI. And the Shadow Stats website has estimated that true inflation rate is around 14%. By the way, they don't allow me sharing a screenshot. They've written all over their website, do not post this, do not copy this, etc. So... I'm going to respect them, but I will share their numbers. Next, we have one of the gurus in the space that understands fiat debasement better than probably anybody on the planet. And this is Safe Dina Moose. He talks about how fiat on planet Earth loses $14 trillion a year, which coincidentally is the same as the fiat dilution, 14%. The global money supply is $100 trillion, Global wealth is $400 trillion. A quarter of all fiat wealth is in fiat. 
And humanity, humanity, the population loses $2,000 per person worldwide each year. The average net worth of a human on the planet is like 7,000. So that's crazy when you think about that. This is the drawbacks of the fiat currency system, and they are not apparent unless you go deep into the numbers. And they manifest its horrible impact on the users over the last 60 years. And again, 60 years, it can be proven. And this dilution is horrific. It reduces global wealth by 3.5% per year, 2,000 per person. And yes, it implies investments yielding less than 14% are effectively not generating gains. So you can see a lot of confluence around that 14% number. In addition, let's just go for some simple numbers, go back in time. Now, I'm not even showing the, <laughs> the recent money supply expansion, which has broke all the records. But let's just go back to 2000 to 2010. You can see here, the money supply went from 4.917 billion, call that 5 trillion, up to $13.3 trillion. And remember, that is a massive increase. That's a huge amount of money chasing the same amount of goods. Uh, what you can also do, by the way, go to your grocery store and have a shopping list from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, three years ago, compared to today. See how much your money buys you. Like I can't tell you the number of times I'm in line and people are there. What? They, they, they you know, they buy their groceries at $256 and they can't believe their eyes. And that's only comparing to last week or the week before. That'll tell you exactly what's going on. But here's another example too. Car prices. Okay, let's look at this. Everybody can relate to this. Remember, there's more automation. There's more efficiency in manufacturing. There's more offshoring, outsourcing, etc. And prices still go up. The car price in January 2012 was 30500 the average car price. Now it's $48,094. As of September 2022, it's even higher today. But that's a chart from Kelly Blue Book, and credit to Daniel Wood on that one. By the way, Tesla is breaking the mold. They found a way to make cars way better, way more advanced, way safer, way more economical, zero service, zero operating cost, apart from the $4 for every 300 miles of charging. And they're coming out with a $25,000 car, which will completely destroy the incumbents in the space, other than maybe BYD in China. So that's another example. So Git, hope that helps. Oh, oh, by the way, I hate to burst anybody's bubble, but I'm showing you old data. It's about to get a whole lot worse. Forget the 14%. With the amount of debt... That's going up and to the right in an exponential manner. They printed $2.3 trillion in new debt in 13 or 14 weeks. Okay? It is absolutely mind-blowing. This is the debt death spiral. We are in the midst of it right now. So 10 years from now, it's going to be a lot worse. Um, so remember, 14% will be an old number. You're going to wish it was 14% very soon. Next question is from... Tom W., what leading indicators do you use help predict where we are in the business cycle, e.g. ISM, building permits, any other purchasing managers, index, etc.? Well, great question. We have a model called the macro model, and this is where it is right now, where it stands. And you can see it went down. That's why we were convinced, obviously, the back in, uh, obviously, C19 triggered a big recession, but there's been a bit of a rebound of late, but we still have a long wait to go down. That big dip in March 2020, you can see there, then the huge rebound. Ever since then, we've been going down, and we had a quick rebound again because of things like the BTFP program that I discussed yesterday. Money printing is happening, but in a covert way. The government is creating jobs for themselves, and they're paying themselves more. They're issuing a lot of debt, which increases GDP but it doesn't hit your pocket. So according to this, this is based up of about 20 different indicators, and we smash it all together and create a composite score, tell us exactly what the economy is doing. It's bad, but it's getting better. How much better? Will it turn around again? I'm not sure. But that's where we see things right now. And final piece as well, Vicious Lee, good to see you, uh, helping animals. Uh, thanks to our Patreon member, Moody Man, 
who nudged us in the direction of Gauntly Birds of Prey, Vulture and Eagle Park in the United Kingdom. And this park is home to over 180 birds from 50 different species. And it's the largest collection, I think, in England. So shout out to Moody Man and thank you for helping us. And we made our donation there this week. And uh, there's some spectacular looking birds. And I must say, I always thought eagles were just in uh, the United States. I didn't think they had them in the United Kingdom. So, wow, that's impressive. And again, thank you all for coming. Don't forget to subscribe to Amplify. Now I'm going to do some live questions, which is the piece I look forward to as well. So I'm going to drink some tea and then we'll go to that as well. So again, thank you, everybody. Thank you to the mods in the chat. And thank you, everybody, for coming. We have three and a half thousand people watching live. That's the biggest Q&A so far in this early bull run. So thank you all for coming. And thank you for the likes too. A thousand likes, which is really impressive. And I didn't even have to ask for it because I don't like asking for anything. I like to give. So let me try to find some questions from the team here. Um, as I juggle 1,700 windows and I forget to turn on the audio. Crazy. Anyway, tomorrow DCA, by the way, will be on Ivan's channel. Uh, 7.30 a.m. Pacific. That's 4.30 Central European time. And Kiwi Robin couldn't stay for the live stream, but shout out to Sanjay Watson, K18D, Mr. Dip, and all of those freely giving their time and knowledge and supporting the amazing Patreon community. Thank you so much for saying that. Adam Q, uh, I've got the bags packed and ready for the next few years. Great stuff. Um, yeah, it's. I must uh, commend everybody that didn't have fear during the dark dark times there were it was a it was a a rough uh, bear market but again billions are made in the bear and uh, being fearful sometimes is dangerous so adam q congratulations on packing your bags and uh from gafello ia plus fa plus ta equals dollars exactly it's fundamentals are so so important they may not work immediately it's FA to determine fundamental analysis, determine what, and TA to determine when, when to get in, when to get out. Very important. Uh, fantasy Collection and Customs. Good to see you back, buddy. I have 40% Bitcoin and 40% Sol and 10% ETH, and the rest are mixed Matic, Link, and Phantom, and 30% cash for crypto, and I'm thinking of adding more ETH. Thoughts, please. So... I've been debating myself on what's kept me from dumping ETH from the beginning of this whole year, and anybody, I share my thoughts very openly all the time. I didn't do it because I didn't want to have too much concentration in Solana. And I regret that, but I don't because, you know, you never know. Anything could blow up. Anything could go to zero real fast. And then you're high and dry. So it is good to have allocations. It's also good to be aware that not all your boats will rise at the same time. Sometimes things will pop. Like Tesla is depressed right now. It's still up 100% for the year, but it's still down from where it was a couple months ago. And, you know, everything in time will rise. You just have to be patient. Um, I think right now, if you look at things like Rune and Matic and Link, they are far outperforming Ethereum. Also, let's just pull up one of the slides I shared earlier. Um, this one here. You pop this up. If you look at ETH getting back to all-time high, it's 131% from today. Okay? If you look at any other asset, it's a lot higher return. So from that perspective, I think um, I wouldn't buy more ETH. I'd buy something that hasn't popped yet or something that's going to go a lot higher. At least look for things that are going to do a 3x, not a 1x from here. Um, and I hope that helps. That's what I would do. Um, and by the way, I invested in things like Render and Injective, and they've done really, really well. But we don't know if they'll continue because some of them are just absolutely gone crazy so far. Ox Solar. Uh, what about Amplefort? Still on the radar, but uh, performed very well. A lot of assets are performing very well. Let me have a quick peek at Amplefort. I know I've looked at it. I can't remember where it ranks right now. Give me one second to pull it up live and see if it is if it has changed. Remember, our models actually test everything in real time um, based on data. There's another question on that as well that came up. Give me one second. It takes a while to pull this up. And all right.
righty. There we are. AMPO. All right. There's two. Hang on. Clear. AMPO. <laughs> I've got to look up a thousand different tokens to find the answers to this one. All righty. Um, low rank. Would I buy? I can tell you very quickly. No. Absolutely do not qualify based on how we rank things. So thank you for the question. Sorry I didn't make the cut. Um, we, again, just, just to make sure people understand, when we look at assets, we know you got to be in the top 2%, probably the top 1%. If you're not at least qualified to get in the top 10% based on our rules, you know, yeah, we're not going to touch you. So hope that helps. And that doesn't mean an asset won't go up. There's assets with nothing behind them. There's assets with one engineer. There's assets that are just pumped to high heaven on Reddit every single day. They're garbage. But the influencers that pump them trick the retail investor. Okay? Don't be tricked. Do fundamental analysis. And don't chase things that are being artificially pumped. Very important. Uh, BTC Maxi. Any math figure price of MicroStrategy in correlation to Bitcoin price? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me... I can actually calculate that on the fly. Um, hold on a second. Uh, give me one second. Let me let me run a quick calculation of the correlation. So, okay. Easy way to think about it is MicroStrategy at thirty-seven thousand is worth about five hundred. If Bitcoin goes to 100,000, micro strategy should be around 1,200. So that's kind of your range. So 500 to 1,200 from 35 to 100K. Uh, I, if I had more time, I could create a little line uh, for you. I'll do that with Bitcoin on the left axis and um, micro strategy on the right. But that's just take those two numbers, draw it on the chart, and that's your result right there. And they are, it works pretty well. But it's also good to play the R between both as well as we go forward. Um, let me see. Matson Magleby. If I missed the early bull run on Solana, should I get in here or wait for correction? Well, I bought at $45 on Friday. And it was nuts because, you know, $45 after a huge run. Last time I bought it was 22 So it had more than doubled. And I bought more, but I had to buy more for certain business reasons too as well. But uh, even with that, let me check where it is now. That was Friday night, by the way. Not even Friday morning, because this thing has been moving so fast. So now it's over 57. So 57.45 has already made a huge return in three days. And I think was Stephen Weston asked the same question a couple of weeks ago. Is it too late to buy Solana? And I thought he had his bags packed, but he wanted more. And I said no, and it was about 30 bucks, 35 bucks at the time. So you just got to look at where it's going to go. And where else can you find a 3x from here or 2.5x or a 6x or whatever else? So take that all with a grain of salt. We don't know, but even looking at my very conservative price targets, I'll pop them up again so you can see. Um, like literally, I believe a lot of these are going to be very possible in the next bull run. Um, somewhere between, say, that 135 mark and easy 225. And probably a lot higher. But take that with a big grain of salt and, of course, not financial advice. Uh, but because we've run so fast, so far, and it's so early, my target originally was 100 bucks for this bull run. And that's now off the table and replaced. So thank you for the question. Next, and it's, uh, next one is from Andrew Maloney. By the way, let's check in on the markets. See what's happening. So China is opening soon, and that should pump Bitcoin price. So expect the usual Sunday afternoon pump and Sunday night as well before Monday morning. So that will be good to watch. Um, let me see. Yeah, Matson, never too late. Andrew Maloney. Don't forget, everybody, to hide your full real names on the internet. There's people coming, and scammers are awful, and they're getting more sophisticated. In fact, their English has gotten better. You could always spot a scammer back in the day because 
their English would be so broken, but now they're using AI to fix their English. Now that sounds very sophisticated. Uh, last question from Andrew Maloney. I'm going to buy more Sol, but I'm trying to wait for a pullback, but not sure what target would be. Again, Friday was 45 for me. The support level is around 53. The next level of resistance is that 64, 65 level. So 53 to 65 is the range you're probably going to bounce in for a while. Uh, as close as you can get to 53, that's where you should snipe. Hope that helps, not financial advice. That's based on the Lilo model, by the way. And thank you as well for your super stickers. Silicon Valley Stoic, Justice for All, Kamikars Creations, Jimmy Neal. Hope the elbow is good. Um, Sir Winston, Forrest M, Dog One, Sigma 103, JT, Investing KO, Martin Brock, Ludvig, Sparky444, big crowd today, Viciously, Dave Spadafora, long-term holder, Mr. Mike, Bitcoin Maxi Mike, and Stephen Weston, all the usual suspects, I love you all. And we even see some that are back that I haven't seen in a while. I think it's... Anyway, thank you all for coming, everybody. 3,500 people. It's a new record for the early bull. And yes, we are literally 11 months in to this early bull. And the future is very bright. Stay healthy. The fireworks are going to be incredible this run. Everything, everything is way better than it could ever be expected. Thank you all. Thank you to the mods in the chat too. Happy weekend. I'll see you all tomorrow on DCA, bright and early. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.